So we're not completely done with our other series on doing. We are still going to kick off an additional series on faith in Hebrews 11. And uh, likely that will expand from the 11th chapter, but let's call it that for now. <laughs> and uh, this is the first of these lessons, and, and uh, I'm trying to come to it uh, the natural way, the way that uh, seems like second nature. If you're a, a student of the Bible, if you've been a Christian for some time, um, very likely you know about Hebrews 11, verse 1, uh, saying, faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. And uh, this is, you know... This is, of course, true, and it is a good definition of the term faith. What is it? You know, well, it is these things. That, that's fine and that's good, but I guess what I'm realizing now is uh, that I've not really treated this correctly, um, and it takes time to figure these things out, I suppose, and God has been merciful and allowed me to live long enough to see these mistakes, but um, too often this verse is taken just all by itself without any context to it. And uh, by doing that, we are losing the richness of the message of Hebrews and of the Bible generally that is genuinely intended by these things, that the point of Hebrews, um, especially, is that we should keep going. <laughs> we should be encouraged and keep going, that we should endure and persist. And this is the meaning, actually, of this verse that is so often lifted from its context. And so I thought, well, let's take a look then what is its context? Well, actually, the context of this Hebrews 11 verse 1 started back in the 10th chapter at the 35th verse. And really, the second verse of the 11th chapter also goes with the definition, something that I had missed for a long time. So the bigger picture around the verse are these things, and, and we ought to look at them. It's uh, Hebrews 10, verse 35, down through 11, verse 2. 35, therefore, do not throw away your confidence, which has a great reward. You have need of endurance so that when you've done the will of God, you may receive what is promised. For, and he quotes, yet a little while, and the coming one will come and will not delay, or what is coming will come and not be delayed. But my righteous one will live by faith. And if he shrinks back, my soul has no pleasure in him. But we're not of those who shrink back and are destroyed. We're of those who have faith and preserve their souls. The faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen, and by faith the people of old received their commendation. These are actually the context. That's the big picture of this thing. What he's getting at is to point us back to the teaching of Habakkuk in Habakkuk uh, 1 and 2, but it's, it's the prophet Habakkuk. And... Um, in Hebrews, you can see this is about holding on to your confidence, enduring, you know, finish doing the will of God so that you can receive what's promised. And we do this by faith. True. We'll get there. We'll, we'll talk about that definition. That's fine. But the big picture, at least right here, is that it follows on to what Habakkuk said. 
And we're not supposed to be of those that shrink back to destruction. We're of those who have faith and preserve our lives. That's really the big picture. Is that It's not the walk of faith. It's not the Christian life to shrink back to destruction. The child of God has that endurance, is sticking it out, is, is you know, keeps going through life and the trials of it with the intent that we will obtain the promise. And this is what Habakkuk is saying. I'd like to turn to that prophet at this time and have a look, if you'll go with me. And you likely have time to find it because I have a hard time finding the minor prophets. But we'll go back to Habakkuk because there's a reason that this is being quoted is the point that we're making here. Uh, there's a reason that this is the one that Hebrews chooses to follow on. Um, the, and it's also important to understand that this is the place where he said the just shall live by faith, or the righteous one shall live by faith, which is quoted both here in, in uh, Hebrews 10 and also uh, in Romans 1. Um, and in other places. So that's another thing, if you will, like Hebrews 11.1, 1, where I'm very familiar with that verse, the just shall live by faith. Uh, and it, get, it's get, uh, it gets used in multiple places in the New Testament. But I've, you know, up until this point in life, I've always missed the larger context, the bigger meaning of this. So in this prophet, Habakkuk, it starts in the first chapter. We look at the second through the fourth verses, as well as the 13th there, just to set it up. But the first thing that happens is the prophet asks God a bunch of questions which boil down to uh, why are we suffering? He said, Lord, how long shall I cry for help and you will not hear? Or cry to you violence and you will not save? Why do you make me see iniquity? Why do you idly look at wrong? Destruction and violence are before me. Strife and contention arise. So the law is paralyzed, and justice never goes forth. For the wicked surround the righteous, so justice goes forth perverted. And at the 13th verse, he said, You who are purer, purer of eyes than to see evil and cannot look at wrong, why do you idly look at traitors and remain silent when the wicked swallows up the man more righteous than he? This is the question of Habakkuk. How long? Which is echoed in the Revelation. Why do you look? Why does it keep happening? Why is justice allowed to be perverted? Why are the righteous allowed to be consumed? It all boils down to why are we suffering? Bad things are happening to us. Um, though we are faithful, Though we are the people of God, why is that happening and how long will that continue? You know, this is the question. And it is the, you know, it's the way that we are thinking when we are in the midst of suffering, when some terrible thing has befallen us or we are in pain or are at loss. Then this is the way that it feels. You know, how long will I cry for help? And it seems like he sees the wrong but doesn't do anything about it. Justice never goes forth, uh, which is clearly overstated. But that's how it feels when we're in the middle of that. 
And God knows that that's how it feels. That's why it's recorded, and that's why Habakkuk was instructed to say and to write these things and to ask this question of God, which, of course, God answers in the second chapter. The Lord answered me, verse 2 begins. So there, there is a reason for that question to be recorded, which is that the answer is recorded. <laughs> and God gives the answer there. Write the vision, make it plain on tablets, verses 2 through 4 of Habakkuk 2. Make it plain on tablets so he may run who reads it. So it's going to be written, and it's going to be written so that the one who reads it can run. As in, speed ahead. When you hear the word of God, you hurry up and do it. For still the vision awaits its appointed time. It hastens to the end. It will not lie. If it seems slow, wait for it. It will surely come. It will not delay. So he said it is to be written so that people read it, and when they read it, they run. Not when it comes, when it arrives, when you've received it, then you run. No. <laughs> it's when you read what God said, then you run. And if it seems slow, wait for it. It will come. It will not delay. Meaning the justice of God is going to come. The reckoning of God is going to come. The answer of God is going to come. Just maybe not on our timetable. Behold, he said, the unrighteous soul is puffed up, not upright within him, but the righteous shall live by his faith. And this is the critical overarching point about this and the thing that I've missed all these years. What this means is not um, that, you know, salvation is through Jesus, not through Moses, and you have to wait until the New Testament times. That's not what he's saying. Although that's true, that's not what it means. What he's saying is, you're asking me why there is suffering. You're asking me when suffering will cease, when justice will prevail and you'll be vindicated. The answer to that is that deliverance comes through faith. How will you live? How will you survive these things? How will you continue? How will you keep on keeping on? It will be through faith. Because faith is trusting, trusting God. How will it happen? It will happen when you trust God. How long will it take? Well, it might take longer than you want it to, longer than you think. But the fact is the righteous will live from faith, meaning that he will, this is how you'll be, you'll be delivered. This is how you will make it. Trusting in God, faith in God is how you survive. It's how you endure. It's how you keep on keeping on. And these things are almost too simple. But that's why it's faith, because it's unseen. What you see is, man, you know, um, bad things are happening here, and I'm ostracized for the truth. And, you know, we are not very numerous because of the truth. And people speak evil of us because of the truth. You know, if you're using your eyes, that's what you see. <laughs> but faith doesn't use the eyes and is not based on the seen. It's the unseen that God is in it all and that God's will is what this is about. And God's word is how his will comes to us. And that is the point that we are living for. That is the reason and the purpose and the thing that we conform to. And our deliverance is coming through that faith in him. Though we suffer here, yet we know that there is a reason and there is a point and there is a blessing and God sees it and God knows about it and there will be vindication that's the whole point of this. Endurance. <laughs> Trust God 
wait it out. Keep on keeping on. That's the meaning of the righteous will live by his faith. It means the right the person who's going to be just is the person who trusts in God and waits for the outcome. Which may not happen in this life. That's the point. It may not happen here. In fact, some of our brothers and sisters, as recorded in Scripture, lost their lives here because of the faith. They, made, they lived their whole lives and did not see that deliverance. Not in the flesh, but in the spirit they had deliverance. They enjoy in the presence of God and his angels a blessed, a blessed existence because of that faith. So we go back to Hebrews you know, that's the real meaning for Habakkuk. Why would you quote Habakkuk here in Hebrews 10 and Hebrews 11? He said, don't throw away your confidence. You have need of endurance. Yet a little while, what's coming will come and not delay, but my righteous one will live by faith. And if he shrinks back, my soul has no pleasure in him. But we're not of those who shrink back and are destroyed, but of those who have faith and preserve their souls. The 36th verse said, you have need of endurance. So when you've done the will of God, you may receive what's promised. Hebrews 10, 36. We needed the endurance, the perseverance, the patience, whatever you want to call it. What kind of, what endurance? Endure what? You endure living here on this earth, doing the will of God, which is not always the pleasant thing, is not always the easy thing. That's endurance, so that when you have done the will of God, meaning this has to be accomplished, it has to be done, you live this way, it's your habit, it's your life. And when that is done, then you will receive what is promised. It will happen. And... Having thought about Habakkuk, he said, why are we suffering? Why is this happening? How long is it going to happen? And God said, wait for it. Trust God, and you'll make it. And here, the apostle tells us at 39 of Hebrews 10, we are not of those who shrink back and are destroyed. That's not what we're about. We're of those who have faith and preserve their souls. And I want to talk about this preservation. We're of those who have faith and preserve their souls. We don't shrink back, which is from Habakkuk, if anyone's soul shrinks back, I, I am not pleased with him. We're not of those that shrink back, whose end is destruction. We are of those who have faith. Having faith is the opposite of shrinking back, you see. Shrinking back, what's that? Shrinking from or, or avoiding, you know, not doing this thing, keeping aloof from it. Having faith is putting your trust in God, and this is what preserves your soul. That's what Habakkuk said, the righteous one will live by his faith. But again, that live is an answer to the question, how long will the righteous be consumed by the unjust? If you want to survive, you want to make it, you do that by faith. Faith is what preserves your life, what keeps you alive, what protects you. So that preservation actually is a word that is talking about a possession, something that is preserved, meaning something that is kept or um, perhaps you would say protected so that it sticks around, so that it can be maintained, it can be held on to. And this is what's meant in Malachi, which I ask you to look at with me, but it's just a couple of verses here. But this is what's meant in Malachi, chapter 3, verses 16 through 18. And you'll see, as I found, that these verses accord 
exactly. They correspond exactly to what Habakkuk said. They correspond exactly to the point that Hebrews is drawing. Malachi 3, 16 through 18. Those who feared the Lord spoke with one another after hearing the exoriating sermon of Malachi in the chapters preceding this. The Lord paid attention and heard them. And a book of remembrance was written before him of those who feared the Lord and esteemed his name. They shall be mine, says the Lord of hosts, in the day when I make up my treasured possession. That word possession, that's our word. Our preserved souls. The day that he makes up his treasured possession is the day that we are preserved. In the day that I make up my treasured possession, I will spare them as a man spares his son who serves him. Then once more, you'll see the distinction between the wicked and the righteous, between the one who serves God and the one who does not serve him. That's Malachi 3, 16 through 18. But he said, for those who chose to serve God in the midst of a generation that did not do so, he heard them. It said there was a book made of remembrance before the Lord. It said, those who feared the Lord, the Lord paid attention and heard them. Those who feared and esteemed his name were written in a book of remembrance before the Lord. He remembers those who serve him. He knows those who are his. And they become a treasured possession. They are spared. They are preserved. We are those who believe, Hebrews 10, 39, to the preservation of our souls. That's the meaning. And again, Malachi said in the 18th, there's a distinction and it will become obvious. See, by faith, we don't perhaps see, <laughs> in fact, we by definition don't see. <laughs> we believe in the unseen. But you will see this. There's a distinction between the righteous and the wicked. There's a distinction between the one who serves God and the one who does not serve God. This is the meaning when you go to your New Testament, for example, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, which also uses this idea of the preservation, the uh, special possession, kept alive, spared, preserved. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 9 to 17, it is. But, you know, all he's getting at in this first part of 9 through 12 in 2 Thessalonians 2, is that there are people who are perishing, who refuse to love the truth so as to be saved. And they believe what's false so that they may be condemned, who didn't believe the truth, but who had pleasure in unrighteousness. There's, there's an outcome for those who do not have faith, who do not believe. But on the other hand, the 13th verse of 2 Thessalonians 2 continues, We give thanks to God for you, brothers, beloved by the Lord, because God chose you as the first fruits to be saved through sanctification by the Spirit and belief in the truth. See what that is? It's Malachi 3.18. There's a distinction between the righteous and the wicked, between the one who serves God and the one who does not serve him. They who do not believe the truth, who do not accept the word of God, are condemned. You see it in the actions that they embrace, the doctrine they embrace. But you who do believe in the truth have been chosen for salvation. There's your deliverance by faith, belief in the truth. The just will be delivered by faith. Those who preserve their souls are those who believe the truth, those who believe in God. Yes, and he continues in the 14th to this, he called you through our gospel that you may obtain the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. You are called so as to obtain the glory. 
And that word obtain is our word for preservation, for the special possession, the deliverance of God, but the, the, the preservation. You will possess the glory of our Lord. That glory has been preserved for you and is being held, is, is waiting. It's for you to attain it, the reason why we are called, see? We believe in the truth, and by this we are chosen for salvation, but the reason that we're called, is to obtain the glory. Why is he saying it? Because we are of those who believe to the preservation of the soul. We're not of those who shrink back to destruction. It is not our lot. It is not our destiny to be destroyed, to be lost. It is our destiny to preserve our lives. When you are a Christian, you are heaven-bound this world is not my home. I'm just a passing through. We are headed towards life. We have a hope, a guiding light through this world that is so dark. Why are you called? So that you may obtain. Yes, Andy said in the 17th, no, I'm sorry, in the 15th verse, brothers, stand firm then. And hold to the traditions you were taught by us, whether by spoken word or by letter. <laughs> Who preserves their souls? Who lives by faith, in other words? Right? Preserving, preserving their souls, Hebrews 10.39, is a synonym for live by faith, Habakkuk 2. Those are the same thing as what he's getting at in Hebrews. Those are the same. And that's the meaning. Who preserves their souls? Who lives by faith or delivers themselves from suffering? Hebrews or Habakkuk 1. By faith, Habakkuk 2. It's those who stand firm and hold to the traditions taught by the apostles. By spoken word or by letter? Did you or I hear spoken word? No. They've been gone forever. <laughs> as far as we're concerned, forever. A couple thousand years, they've been gone from planet Earth. Not by spoken word, by letter. We got all of it by letter, but they're just as binding. Whether they heard them in person as these things were being written down, or whether we have their word because it has been written down, is just as binding. It's the same thing. And we who stand firm and hold to that are those who are living by faith, are those who are preserving our souls, are those who are obtaining what has been promised. And I say this because there's so many who want faith to be without conditions, without justification, without obedience, actions, confirmation, and that's simply completely, wholly, entirely unbiblical. It, there could be nothing further from the truth. You see very plainly in 2 Thessalonians that there are those who do not receive the love of the truth so as to be saved, and God causes them to believe the lie so that it may be clear Remember Malachi 3, that there's a distinction between the righteous and the unrighteous. But we who are not of those that disbelieve or that shrink back to destruction, we who are of those who do believe to the preservation of the soul, we are they who stand firm and hold the traditions of the apostles by their written word. Who are they? They are the ones who demand book, chapter, and verse. That is faith. It is faith. Don't let anybody tell you, well, that's just legalism. That's works. No, it's not. That's faith. That's the thing that will actually save you. That's what will actually preserve you alive. And First Peter continues the thought about the special possession, which is our preservation. First Peter chapter 2 it's verses 7 through 11. The honor is for you who do believe, but for those who do not believe, the stone that the builders rejected has become 
the cornerstone, which is Psalm, which is in the Psalms, and a stone of stumbling, a rock of offense, which is from Isaiah. The honors for you who do believe, but for those who don't believe, the stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone and the stone of stumbling, a rock of offense. They stumble because they disobey the word as they were destined to do. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession. That's the word for preservation. We are his own possession. We are preserved. How are we preserved? We are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. You see how great the church is, that it is the Israel of God today. That's what he, uh, 1 Peter 2 is saying right there at verse 9. We are the chosen race who believe in God, who are the children of Abraham by faith. That's the chosen race. We are the royal priesthood. What's the royal priesthood? Royal, well, under the law of Moses, royal was Judah and priesthood. Uh, royalty is, is Judah. Priestliness is Levitical, Levi. What's a royal priesthood? Melchizedek, king of Salem and priest of the Most High God, which is what Hebrews tells us earlier, prior to getting to Hebrews 10. It's Melchizedek. He's the royal priesthood. We are following in the priesthood of Christ, who is both king and priest. And yes, 1 Peter 2, verse 9, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, so that you may proclaim the excellencies of the one who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once had not received mercy, but now have received mercy. And the 11th verse, very pointedly, Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles, abstain from the passions of the flesh that wage war against your soul. Sojourners and exiles, see? It's what Habakkuk said. How long will we suffer here? How long will injustice prevail here? So we go back into Hebrews 10. Oof. As we draw to a close, let's have a look again at this immediate context and focus back in on that verse 11.1. But Hebrews 10, you know, 35 to 11.2 is, is the immediate context of verse 1 of chapter 11. And something that I had not seen until very recently was this 39th verse actually goes together, Hebrews 10.39 goes together with Hebrews 11.1. We are not of those who shrink back and are destroyed. Rather, faith is the assurance of things hoped for. This is actually a parallelism that's not obvious in English, to be fair. But in the original language, it is a play on words. There's, there's a very clear parallelism. We are not the shrinking back. Rather, faith is the assurance. Those are in a, a parallelism that is very clear in the original language and is how these fit together, how the thought continues is what we're saying. To put chapter 11, verse 1 right there is to do violence <laughs> to the text. They're breaking the thought right in the middle of it, which is actually the same thought continuing in the original language. So faith, then, we are told, is the assurance of things hoped for, 
on the contrary to what you're seeing above with those that shrink back to destruction. We're not shrinking back, we're assured. What is that assurance? Well, the word for assurance here is a word that's talking about the solid reality of a thing. I don't want to go philosophical on this, and so I'm trying to shy away from giving um, you know, the lexicon definitions of this, although that's a useful and an interesting study uh, and is the way that I've approached this in the past. I think that it's a mistake to go too far down that road. What he's getting at is what we hope for is not fanciful. What we hope for is not um, doubtful. It is a solid reality. We hope in the resurrection of the dead. We hope in eternal life because the resurrection of the dead is a solid reality. That is real. Eternal life is a solid reality. That is definitely real. It definitely exists. It is there. And that's why we hope in it. That's what faith is the assurance of things hoped for means. Faith is when what you hope is totally real. Absolutely, it's there. Faith is also the conviction of things not seen. What is the conviction? This is the word that means, you know, the final conclusion. What it all comes down to, we, you know, when everything has been considered and everything has been heard and we've reasoned through and listened to, you know, the arguments, we've reached the answer, the conclusion. That's the meaning of conviction here. Faith is the answer regarding things not seen. So both what you hope for and things not seen, these are both things that you don't see. Remember Romans 8 said, why do you hope for something that you already see? <laughs> these are things that are not seen because faith is not um, by sight. We walk by faith, not by sight. And also, as Jesus said to Thomas at the end of John, have you believed because you've seen? Which should actually be read, you haven't believed because you've seen, have you? Those who are blessed are those who believe and have not seen. That's what he said to Thomas. It's about the unseen things. That's the meaning of faith. Faith is when you're certain that the things that you don't see yet, resurrection from the dead, eternal life, heaven with God, the spiritual realm, God himself, are nonetheless totally, completely, 100% real. They absolutely are there. And you live like that, with the full knowledge that that is completely real, though I can't see it right now. That's faith. That's what faith is. And faith is also this third prong that I've missed so many times. Is verse 2, the means by which the people of old received their commendation. What is it that received their commendation? It means faith is your supporting witness. If you are being examined in court 
as to whether or not you believe in God. The thing that can be brought forward, the testimony that can be given, that is the faith. It's your faith. When we say receive their commendation, what we actually mean is they uh, received supporting testimony. Somebody, some witness came forward and bore witness about them to affirm what they were, what they are. It means faith is our supporting witness. Faith bears testimony about us. Well, right. If we keep going for a moment as we think about this, the third verse is meant to explain the unseen things. And, the, and uh, I believe that what is hoped for fits under the umbrella of unseen things. And the fourth verse is meant to explain what it means to receive that commendation by faith, which is, which is to say the testimony by faith, the fourth and fifth verses. So they actually are intended to explain what was said in the first and second verses, the elements of faith being the hope or the, uh, the, you know, the reality of, the, of our hope, the uh, conviction about things not seen, the testimony of our lives. Hebrews 11.3 said it's by faith that we understand the universe was created by the word of God. And if the Bible account of how the word of God or how the universe was created does not seem true to you, that means you do not have faith. That's what that means. You don't believe God. What is now seen was not made out of things that are visible. We believe in the unseen. That was there first. And if that's not the way that you understand the genesis of counter creation, you do not have faith. That's not faith. And in the fourth verse, Abel offered to God a more acceptable sacrifice than Cain by faith. And through this faith, he was commended as righteous, meaning he received the testimony that he was just. How? By faith. But how faith? By offering. God commended him by accepting. Enoch walked with God 300 years and then he was taken up because he had pleased God. And it said in the fifth verse, Enoch, before he was taken up, was commended as having pleased God. He received that testimony of his life. So what's the conclusion? Well, this context actually concludes at the end of chapter 11 into the start of chapter 12, all of these that we will talk about, we'll talk about Abraham and Sarah and Isaac and all the others in this hall of faith, Hebrews 11. But he said, he said in 39, all these, though commended through faith, did not receive what was promised. Remember, he said, you were called so as to obtain what is promised. Second Thessalonians, remember that? Think about your own soul. These were commended through faith, but didn't receive the promise God had provided something better for us that apart from us they should not be completed. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. That's the meaning. We're running a race. Keep on, keep it on, endure, and do it by faith. Trust in God that it is going to work out in the end. It is worth it. There is a repayment. God is not unjust.
How do you do it? It's verse 2 of Hebrews 12, looking to Jesus, founder and perfecter of the faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising its shame, and is now seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Today, are you a Christian? Have you become a child of God? You need to be a child of God. Trusting in Jesus, trusting in God and the power of deliverance, not just now, but through life by faith. You repent, you change your heart to serve God from now on. You confess him as the Christ, the Son of God, believing Jesus is raised, that he had been put to death, though, for our salvation. He's the author and the perfecter of the faith. He finished it off for us, too. He, he created it, and he, and he finished it. He's the one who laid that sacrifice down so that we could be forgiven and adopted as God's children. Today, if you are not a Christian, put Jesus on in baptism for forgiveness of your sins, to begin that life of faith. Are you today a Christian? Continue that life of faith. Keep on. Keep going. Endure. We may not see it now. We may not see it on our timetable, but we will see it. We will obtain it. God knows those who are His. If you haven't lived right, repent. Pray God for forgiveness. Let us pray on your behalf that you might be restored to Him. If you need our prayers, if you need to obey the gospel, please let your need in the Spirit be known now by coming to the front while we stand and sing the song selected.